In this section, we're going to take up greenhouse gases. If you leave your car with its windows up in the sun on a comfortable 75 degree day, within 30 minutes, the temperature in the car can rise to 109 degrees. This is how a greenhouse, which traps solar radiation, works. It's also why you should never, ever leave your pets in a car on a sunny day with the windows up. When we talk about the greenhouse effect, we are referencing how the Earth's atmosphere, and certain gases in particular, allow solar radiation to heat our planet. Even though our atmosphere is an incredibly thin layer, a single layer of lacquer on a basketball would be proportionally thicker. It nonetheless keeps our planet warm. CO2, methane, and other gases, also called greenhouse gases, um, contribute to this greenhouse gas effect. Greenhouse gases are not in themselves bad. Without them, the Earth would be too cold to be habitable. However, because we have been pumping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere over the past 400 years, especially the past 60 years, our planet is warming quickly. We initially referred to the impact uh, that increased levels of greenhouse gases have on the planet as the greenhouse effect. Then is global warming. However, now that we realize that an increase in these atmospheric gases is changing our global climate in a range of ways, and by that I mean like hurricanes, more severe droughts, changes in regional weather patterns, and so forth, we refer to all this and global warming as climate change. More recently, we've had another reconceptualization as we now refer to what is happening as the climate crisis. For years, there was a reluctance among scientists and activists to seem like alarmists. However, when people like Greta Thunberg unabashedly began declaring that her house is on fire, we no longer hesitate to describe what is happening as a true global crisis, which it is. Knowing that I'm interested in the climate crisis, people used to ask me when climate change was going to begin happening. Unfortunately, questioning when global warming or climate change is going to begin is simply misguided. It's already begun. Since 1880, average global temperatures have risen by a little more than one degree Celsius, and that's around two degrees Fahrenheit, with an average rise of about 0.08 degrees Celsius per decade during that time. However, since 1981, the increase has now doubled this rate, that's 0.18 degrees Celsius. Climate change is now impacting the entire planet and all life on it. No place on the face of the globe will be left untouched, from the upper limits of the atmosphere to the deepest ocean floors. So let's consider how the climate crisis is changing our planet and its life. The Earth has experienced five major extinction events where 75% or more of all animals on the planet died off in a relatively short period. Most people are familiar with the fifth extinction event, which killed off the dinosaurs 66 million years ago. But number three is of special interest in terms of climate change. 252 million years ago, the Permian-Triassic event was an extinction event caused by some sort of major eruption, perhaps a volcano. Whatever the cause, increased CO2 levels quickly caused global temperatures to rise by 5 degrees Celsius, which initiated the cascade of events such as the rise of methane. During the Permian-Triassic extinction event, 97% of all life on Earth died. In comparison, just 75% of life on Earth died during the Jurassic event that killed the dinosaurs. Estimates suggest that we are currently adding CO2 to the atmosphere at 10 times faster of a rate than happened during the Permian-Triassic event. Since the temperature of the Earth has already risen by 1 degree Celsius, we are 20% of the way toward the conditions that brought about the most extreme extinction event in Earth's history. As a consequence of this and other factors, such as habitat loss, experts suggest that we are now in the midst of our planet's sixth extinction event. The 2014 book, The Sixth Extinction and the Natural History by Elizabeth Gobert, won a Pulitzer Prize, and it's a compelling and excellent introduction to this uh, issue if you're interested. The UN Convention on Biodiversity estimates that every year up to 150 species are lost. In other words, up to 50,000 species are becoming extinct every year. As Cobert notes, this is perhaps 10,000 times the normal rate of extinction. 
Although the dis extinction rate is disturbing in itself, it only tells part of the story as the overall number of extant animals on the planet has been dramatically reduced by human action. So here's a pop quiz. It's not an actual quiz, but i um, just curious if you know the answer to this. What do you think weighs more? All of the wild mammals, birds, reptiles, and amphibians on the planet of the Earth weighs more by a lot. B, all the wild animals, birds, and reptiles, and amphibians on the face of the Earth, but weighs more by a little. C, human beings and all our animals, but I mean livestock and pets, weighs more by a little. Or lastly, human beings and our wild and our animals, and I mean livestock and pets, by a lot. Um, all of the wild animals, birds, and reptiles, and amphibians on the face of the earth constitutes just 3% of the planet's biomass. Human beings and our animals, livestock and pets, constitutes 97%. While estimates vary, there are around 900 million dogs and 600 million cats on earth. This pales in comparison to livestock. We maintain a global herd of about 70 billion, and that's billion with a B, livestock animals for food and other products. This translates into 10 livestock animals for every human being on Earth. However, this is misleading as certain people, especially in, in wealthier countries, consume far more meat than others. In the U.S., per capita meat consumption is 265 pounds per year. In Bangladesh, it's 4 pounds per year. In any event, faced with climate change and other human-caused issues like the loss of habitat, plants and animals have three options to adapt, and by that I mean to evolve, to move, to meaning migrate, or to die. Let's consider these three options. Adapt. For the past 30 million years or so, the Earth has been cooling, thanks to all that CO2 safely sequestered in fossil fuel uh, form underground. During that time, life on Earth was able to evolve to thrive in the changing cooler climate. Given enough time, life can dramatically evolve. In less than one-tenth that time, human beings evolved from a small primate the size of a chimpanzee, and by that I mean Australopithecus, Lucy, to us. Unfortunately, contemporary anthropogenic climate change is happening far too quickly for most species to evolve in response, leaving them with the next two options. Migration is the second one. Half of life on Earth, plants and animals, is now migrating in response to anthropogenic climate change. For the most part, migration is toward the poles and its cooler temperatures. On land, the average migration rate is 10 miles per year. Ocean life is moving four times that fast, 40 miles per year. However, life near the North Pole is as often moving south as the ice sheets break up. Polar bears moving down and grizzly bears moving up recently collided and have successfully bred the first Pisley bear in the wild, which was recorded in 2006. As life migrates toward the poles, it can have a range of consequences, some worrisome. For example, the Zika virus, which was first discovered in Brazil, and which, has, uh, which is often transmitted by mosquitoes that live in tropical regions. Um, it's now in the U.S. and moving up. Option three, if life cannot evolve and migrate, the only option is to die. For example, coral, which is in fact an animal, even though it looks sort of like a rock, um, which can then move great distances and it can't evolve fast enough to adapt to rising ocean temperatures. Sorry, there's an airplane flying overhead. Uh, um, Coral cannot adapt to rising ocean temperatures and increase carbon acidification. We'll talk more about that later. Uh, corals now dying across the planet. Roughly half of the world's coral reefs have died in the past 30 years. Scientists predict that 90% of corals will die by 2050. Incidentally, the film Chasing Coral takes this issue up in detail. The loss of the planet's coral reefs have profound implications for life on Earth. Life in ecosystems is deeply intertwined. 25% of our plant's marine life lives on and depends on coral reef ecosystems. Once the coral is gone, these ecosystems will largely collapse. This is, of course, very bad news indeed for our oceans. It's also a problem for human beings. Roughly 1 billion people rely on coral reef ecosystems for food, especially protein. 
Our planet's oceans are performing an extraordinary service for us and animals that has greatly reduced the impact of the climate crisis. If it wasn't for our oceans, the atmosphere would have risen far more than its current one degree Celsius. Unfortunately, this is killing our oceans. Over 90% of the heat from climate change has been absorbed by the oceans. Since the oceans are absorbing CO2 where they are in contact with the atmosphere, which of course is over 75% of the planet, they are also becoming acidic. Roughly 30% of CO2 released by human action has been absorbed by the oceans. Unfortunately, many plants and animals are sensitive to changes in acidity. Coral is a prime example. It's not just dying because of rising temperatures, but also because of rising acidity. Warmer air is now melting ice across the planet, such as the massive Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets. In addition, ice sheets over the ocean, such as the North Pole, are also melting because of warmer water below. By 2050, ships will likely be able to sail across the North Pole. Eventually, perhaps by the end of the century, the North Pole will be gone. This will only increase global temperatures as the Earth's ice sheets reflect heat back into space. In contrast, dark oceans absorb heat. Thanks to all this melting ice, sea level will certainly rise over the next century. Conservative estimates are that it will rise by at least 1 meter 39 inches. Some estimates are for a rise of 10 feet, three times that amount. Since a third of the world's cities are on the coast and over 60 million people live within 40 feet of the ocean, this will have profound impact on human life. Sea level rise is already impacting a range of places from Miami, Florida to the whole, uh, to whole islands in the Pacific. Uh, before the FUD, the Leonardo DiCaprio film explores this issue in some detail. Even a relatively small amount of sea level rise will have profound implications for humanity. Let's consider what will happen when the oceans rise by just two feet. Even conservative estimates are that this will happen in the next few decades. Some estimates suggest that this will have five, will have five times this rise during the century. 40% of our land, of the land in Bangladesh, will be lost with just two feet of sea level rise. Two feet of sea level rise will flood the entire coast of Florida. Roughly 70% of Florida's population lives in coastal countries. Miami is already regularly flooding during fair weather due to sea level rise. Sorry about the noise. Who will be most impacted by this? Poorer people and poorer countries will suffer from climate change more than the wealthy. The great irony is that the wealthier countries and individuals are contributing to climate change far more by emitting far more greenhouse gases. An average American is responsible for 16.4 metric tons of CO2 or equivalent gases being emitted per year. The average person in sub-Saharan Africa emits 0.08 tons, less than one ten twentieth that amount. While population is certainly an issue with respect to climate change, it can be misleading. Africa is composed of over 40, uh, 50 different countries. Together, they have a population that is nearly four times the U.S. However, since the average African has greenhouse gas emissions that are one twentieth the average Americans, the U.S. is contributing to climate change five times more than the entire continent of Africa. Even if Africa's population doubled with everything else being equal, the U.S. would still be emitting more than twice as much as the entire continent of Africa. When Americans suggest that global population is the root problem of climate change and look to places like Africa or India, India where per capita CO2 emissions are less than one-tenth of the U.S. as examples, is not only misguided and simply wrong, it, it can honestly under, you reveal an underlying racism. Greenhouse gas emissions should always be thought of as a ratio of emissions to population. If we were to compare Africa to the U.S. using this approach, with lower being better, Africa as the benchmark of 1.0, the U.S. would currently be at around 5.0, um, though Africa's population is roughly four times that of the U.S. In other words, even though Africa's population is, around, is four times greater than the U.S., the U.S. is contributing five times more to global climate change than the entire continent of Africa. When we refer to social inequality of climate change as environmental justice, or more recently as climate justice, um, what this means is environmental justice first can refer to any sort of environmental issues such as point source pollution. These can often be local, such as the water crisis in Flint, Michigan. They can be regional or global as well. 
Climate justice focuses on climate change in particular, which is a global issue. In both cases, the issue of environmental and social justice are deeply intertwined, which is something that the true um, cost documentary makes clear and something that we will take up in greater detail during this um, series.